<laughs> Eugene Big Daddy Lipscomb was sweet to women and mean to running backs. They were the two dominating poles of his existence, and his entire life was directed toward the pursuit of one or the other. Pursuit is what separated Daddy from other defensive linemen in the 50s. He roamed the field, showing up in unexpected places, moving his immense body with astonishing speed. Big Daddy was the forerunner of, of the large, quick, agile lineman of, of this day and age. He came up and he was kind of an oddity at the time. Uh, there were people as heavy as he was, but they were big fatties kind of. Big Daddy was 6'9 and weighed somewhere between 280 and 300 with an asterisk. Big Daddy played the soft tackle. He was responsible for draws. He was responsible for screens because he had so much speed. Daddy had so much speed outside, he could run a halfback down and, and tackle him from behind. I said, I know how the uh, mouse feels when a big cat's after him. The big cat was Big Daddy's after me. He caught me, he fell on top of me, he covered over. The rest of the defensive players jumped on him. There were about five of them at that time. The whistle blew. Everybody got up. Big Daddy picked me up and says, you all right, sweet pea? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm all right. The seven years I knew him, I never had to buy no shoes. He always gave me his shoes. And um, uh, his football shoes, he would let me break them in for him. Got to fighting over that one day. He let me warm in the rain one day, and I put the brakes on, and the whole side fell out. And he wanted me to pay him forty some dollars for some shoes. I said, I refused to do it. He told me to break them in because she had bad feet. I did it, and here's your shoes. Big Daddy knocked quarterbacks out of their shoes. Number 76 had an ornery streak, a trait shared by his equally ill-tempered teammates. The Colts were a close-knit, roughhouse crew who loved a good brawl on the field and a good laugh off it. They were talking about nationalities, and, you know, I guess John United said, I'm a Lithuanian, and Alex Sandusky said, well, I happen to be Polish. And they came to Arthur Donovan, and he said, well, naturally, I'm Irish. And they came to Big Daddy, and he kind of revered Arthur Donovan, and he said, well, I'm like Artie. He said, I'm Irish, too. Big Daddy was deathly afraid of uh, somebody coming in the night and killing him. And I hear he used to sleep in Sherman Plunkett's house, and he used to sleep with the bed up against the door so nobody could get in the bedroom. He would come in the dining hall every day, and everybody had a seat. And after we got to know each other a little better, he always sat at the head of the table, I sat at the left, and Lenny sat at the right. And nobody sat in his place. If he's late getting there, his seat is waiting on him. Nobody touched the cold cuts until he get what he want. So one day this boy came from Pittsburgh. He was a big country boy, weighed about 400 pounds. They couldn't find no shoes to fit him. And um, I gave him a pair of shoes, and he came down and sitting there at his chair. And everybody started laughing. And um, certain cold cuts, Big Daddy didn't eat. He ate liverworth, and that's what he wanted. And this guy came in and forked a whole stack of liverworth and took it, put it on his sandwich. And Big Daddy came in and told him he was in his seat and was eating his meat. I said, oh, God, here we go now. And this big dude, he got up and put a chair across his head and just broke it into about 50 pieces. And I looked at Lenny, and Lenny looked at me. We said, we better get the big man out of here because this dude don't look like he take no stuff. While no man sat in Big Daddy's place, no team could unseat the Colts, who won NFL championships in 1958 and 59 against the Giants. When aroused, he played at his best. And it was an angry Big Daddy that made the 1959 championship the crowning moment of his career. This king of the mountain plunged straight downhill. Dressed to kill on a football field, Big Daddy died naked in the outside world. I heard that he had a, a, a tremendous capacity for drinking. I heard it alleged, I could not uh, document it, that it was not unusual for him to drink a case of whiskey on a weekend. Very immaculate dresser. Loved clothes, loved good cars. Loved to be out in the spots where the ladies were. He loved to go into a bar and buy him a drink. 
And then you had the leeches crowding around that would take advantage of Big Daddy. And he always carried on all his money in, in, in cash in his pocket because he figured big as he was and as strong and mean looking as he was, a robber would think about hitting Fort Knox before he thought about hitting Big Daddy. The night of May 10th, 1963, began as a night of bright lights, bold women, and hard liquor. But the night snaked down back alleys, where high times met hard times. In a rundown apartment on North Bryce Street, Big Daddy was found unconscious. Rushed to Baltimore's Lutheran Hospital, he was pronounced dead on arrival. Came in as a routine case of sudden death of unknown causes. And uh, it was only after our examination that we found out what really happened to him, which is at the bottom line that he died of heroin overdose. There were buddies around him at all times. He always wore these cut-off sweatshirts, sloppy Joe kind of sweatshirts, where his arms were always exposed. We would have noticed something. Big Daddy was one who would not take a needle, scared to death of taking the flu shot needles. Well, nobody likes needles, but he and Jim Park and a couple other guys were deathly afraid of needles, so I couldn't see him any way of taking a needle. I would say that uh, somebody, it was planned, or somebody did something, you know, it was foul play, really. Well, if you saw the body of Big Daddy, nobody forced him unless he was incapacitated. And we obviously had to check for that and didn't find anything. There was a man in the Baltimore Police Department at the time named Lieutenant Carroll. He was probably a one-man narcotic squad. He said, well, John, I want you to know that there were tracings, tracings in both arms. And I said to him, Lieutenant, as best as I can recall, how long do you think that that situation existed? And he said, only a guess, but I would say six months. So that Big Daddy had been participating in that kind of an activity for six months in the opinion of Lieutenant Carroll. I'm afraid and almost hate to say that if he hadn't died of a drug overdose, he may well have died of chronic alcoholism. Tragedy stalked Big Daddy. He never knew his father, and his mother was stabbed to death. Now he too was dead at age 32. He was an overgrown kid. He was a child at heart. Uh, this big, massive structure had a heart of gold. Boy, he'd go down into the heart of the ghetto, boy, and just pick these little kids up and put on his shoulders, you know, and that's the real Big Daddy Lipscomb. I remember passing by the coffin and saying that he almost looked like he was sleeping, that uh, I could not believe that I was looking at a corpse. He, he was a handsome man in life, and he was a handsome man in death. It just was beyond comprehension that Eugene Big Daddy Lipscomb, as huge as he was, uh, who loved life as much as he did, uh, could have come to that kind of an ending. 